So this is part 12 of Good Omens. If there was one thing that Mary Hodges, formerly loquacious, was good at, it was attempting to obey orders. She liked orders. They made the world a simpler place. What she wasn't good at was change. She really liked the chattering order. She made friends for the first time. She had a room of her own for the first time. Of course, she knew that it was engaged in things which might, from certain viewpoints, be considered bad. But Mary Hodges had seen, had seen quite a lot of life in 30 years and had no illusions about what most of the human race had to do in order to make it from one week to the next. Besides, the food was good and you got to meet interesting people. The order, such as was left of it, had moved after the fire. After all, their sole purpose in existing had been fulfilled. They went their separate ways. She hadn't gone. She rather liked the manor, and, she said, someone ought to stay and see it was properly repaired because you couldn't trust workmen these days unless you were on top of them the whole time, in a manner of speaking. This meant breaking her vows, but Mother Superior said this was all right, nothing to worry about, breaking vows was perfectly okay in a black sisterhood, and it would be all the same in a hundred years' time, or rather eleven years' time, so if it gave her any pleasure here were the deeds in an address to follow to forward any mail unless it came in a brown in long brown envelopes with windows in the front then something very strange had happened to her left alone in the rambling building working from one of the few undamaged rooms arguing with men with cigarette stubs behind their ears and plaster dust on their trousers and the kind of pocket calculator that comes with a different answer if the sums involved or in used notes. She discovered something she never knew existed. She discovered, under layers of silliness and eagerness to please, Mary Hodges. She found it quite easy to interpret builders' estimates and do VAT calculations. She'd got some books from the library and found finance to be both interesting and uncomplicated. She stopped reading the kind of women's magazine that talks about romance and knitting and started reading the kind of women's magazine that talked about orgasms. But apart from making a mental note to have one if ever the occasion presented itself, she dismissed them as only romance and knitting in a new form. So she started reading the kind of magazine that talked about mergers. After much thought, she'd bought a small home computer from an amused and condescending young dealer in Norton. After a crowded weekend, she took it back. Not as he thought, not as he thought when she walked back into the shop to have a plug put on it, but because it didn't have a 387 co processor. That bit he understood. He was a dealer, after all, and could understand quite long words. But after the that conversation rapidly went downhill from his point of view. Mary Hodges produced yet more magazines. Most of them had the term PC somewhere in, the, in their title, and many of them had articles and reviews that she had circled carefully in red ink. She read about new women. She hadn't ever realized that she'd been an old woman, but after some thought, she decided that titles like that were all one with the romance and the knitting and the orgasms, and the really important thing was to be yourself just as hard as you could. She'd always been inclined to dress in black and white. All she needed to do was raise the hemlines, raise the heels, and leave off the wimple. It was while we leafing through a magazine one day that she learned that, according to the country, there was an apparently insatiable demand for commodious buildings and spacious grounds run by people who understood the needs of the business community. The following day, she went out and ordered some stationery in the name of the Tadfield Manor Conference and Management Trading Training Center, reasoning that by the time it had been printed, she'd known all that was necessary to know about running such places the ads went out the following week. It had turned out to be an overwhelming success because Mary Hodges realized early in her new career as herself that management training didn't have to mean sitting people down in front of unreliable slideshow pr slide projectors. Firms expected far more than that these days. She provided it. Crowley sank down with his back against a statue. Zerafel had already toppled backwards into a redundant on bush a dark stain spreading across his coat. Crowley felt dampness suffusing his own shirt. 
This was ridiculous. The last thing he needed now was to be killed, and we require all sorts of explanations. They didn't hand out new bodies just like that. They always wanted to know what she'd done with the old, old one. It was like trying to get a new pen from her to from a particularly blooded minded stationary department. He looked at his hand in disbelief. Demons have been able to see in the dark, and he could see that his hand was yellow. He was bleeding yellow. Gingerly, he tasted his finger. Then he crawled over to a fall and checked the angel's shirt. If the stain on it was blood, something had gone very wrong with biology. Ooh, that stung, moaned the fallen angel. Caught me right under the ribs. Yes, but do you normally bleed blue? said Crawley. Aziraphale's eyes opened. His right hand patted his chest. He sat up. He went through the same crude forensic self-examination as Crowley. Paint? He said. Crowley nodded. What are they playing at? said Aziraphale. I don't know, said Crowley, but I think it's called silly buggers. His tone suggested that he could play too, and do it better. It was a game. It was tremendous fun. Nigel Thompson, assistant head, purchasing, squirmed through the undergrowth, his mind aflame with some of the more memorable scenes of some of the better Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood movies, and to think he'd believe that management training was going to be boring, too. There had been a lecture, but it had been about the pink guns and all the things you should never do with them, and Tompkins had looked at the fresh young faces of his rival trainees as, to a man, they resolved to do them as if there was half a chance of getting away with it. If people told you business was a jungle and then put a gun in your hand, then it was pretty obvious to Thompson that they weren't expecting you to simply aim for the shirt. And what it was all about was the corporate head hanging over your fireplace. Anyway, it was rumored that someone over in the United Con Consulated had done his promotional prospects a considerable amount of good by the anonymous application of a high-speed earful of paint to an immediate superior, causing the latter to complain of little ringing noises in important meetings and eventually to become, to, and eventually to be replaced on medical grounds. And there were his fellow trainees, fellow sperms, to switch, to switch metaphors, all struggling forward in the knowledge that there could only be one chairman of industrial holdings, holdings, PLC, and that the job would probably go to the biggest prick. Of course, some girl with a clipboard from personal had told them that the courses they were going on were just to establish leadership potential, group cooperation, initiative, and so on. The trainees had tried to avoid one another's faces. It had worked quite well so far. The whitewater canoeing had taken care of John Stone, punctured eardrum, and the mountain climbing in Wales had done for Whittaker, groin strain. Tompkins thumbed, under, thumbed another paint pellet into the gun and muttered business mantras to himself. Do unto others before they do unto you. Kill or be killed. Either shit or get out of the kitchen. Survival of the fittest. Make my day. He crawled a little nearer to the figures by the statue. They didn't seem to have noticed him. When the available cover ran out, he took a deep breath and leapt to his feet. Okay, douchebags, get some... Sk oh, no! Where one of the figures had been, there was something dreadful. He blacked out. Crowley restored himself to his favorite shape. I hate having to do that, he murmured. I'm always afraid I'll forget how to change back, and it could ruin a good suit. I think the maggots were a, were a bit over the top myself, said Azurafel without much rancor. Angels had certain moral standards to maintain, and so unlike Crowley, he preferred to buy his clothes rather than wish them into being from raw firmament, and the shirt had been quite expensive. I mean, just look at it, he said. I'll never get the stain out. Miracle lit away, said Crowley, scanning the undergrowth for any more management trainees. Yes, but I'll always know the stain was there, you know, deep down, I mean, said the angel. He picked up the gun and turned it over in his hands. I've never seen one of these before, he said. There was a pinging noise, and the statue beside them lost an ear. Let's not hang around, said Crawley. He wasn't alone. This is a very odd gun, you know, very strange. I thought you saw I disapproved of guns, said Crawley. He took the gun from the angel's plump hand and sighted along the stubby barrel. 
Current thinking favors them, said Aziraphale. They lend weight to moral argument. In the right hands, of course. Yeah? Crowley snaked a hand over the metal. That's all right, then. Come on. He dropped the gun on to the recumbent form of Tompkins and marched away across the damp lawn. The front door of the manor was unlocked. The pair of them walked through unheeded. Some plump young men in army fatigues spattered with paint were drinking cocoa out of mugs in what had once been the sisters' refector refectory, and two or three of them gave a cheery wave. Something like a hotel reception desk now occupied one end of the hall. It had been a quietly competent look. Aziraphale gazed at the board of an aluminum easel beside it. The little plastic letters let into the back black fabric of the board were the words August 20 to 21, United Holdings, Holdings, PLC Initiative Combat Course. Meanwhile, Crowley had picked up the pamphlet from the desk and showed glossy pictures of the manor with special references to its jacuzzis and indoor heated swimming pools, and on the back was a sort of map that conference centers always have, which makes use of a careful misscaling to suggest that it is handy for every motorway exit in the nation while carefully leaving out the labyrinth of country lanes that in fact surrounds it for miles on every side. Wrong place, said Aziraphale. No. Wrong time, then. Yes. Crowley leafed through the booklet and in the hopes of any in the hope of any clue. Perhaps it was too much to hope that the chattering order would still be here. After all, they'd done their bit. He soft he hissed softly. Probably they'd gone to the darkest America or somewhere to convert the Christians, but he read on anyway. Sometimes this sort of leaflet had a little historical bit, because the kind of companies that hired places like this for a weekend of interactive personal analysis or a conference on the strategic marketing dynamic liked to feel that they were being strategically interacting in the very building, give or take a couple of complete rebuildings, a civil war, and two major fires at some Elizabethan fancier had endowed as a plague hospital. Not that he was actually expecting a sentence like, until 11 years ago, the manor was used as a convent by an order of satanic nuns who weren't in fact all that good at it, really. But she never knew. A plump man wearing desert cam camouflage and holding a polystenic cup of coffee wandered up to them. Who's winning? He said chummily. Young Evison of forward planning caught me a right zinger on the elbow, you know. We're all going to lose, said Crawley absently. There was a burst of firing from the ground. Not the snap and zing of pellets, but the full-throated crackle of aerodynamically shaped bits of lead traveling extremely fast. There was an answering stutter. The redundant warriors stared one on another. A further burst took out a reg rather ugly Victorian stained glass window beside the door and stitched a row of holes in the plaster by Crowley's head. Aziraphale grabbed his arm. What the hell is it? He said. Crowley smiled like a snake. Nigel Tompkins had come to with a mild headache and a vague empty space in his recent memory. He was not to know that the human brain, when faced with a sight too terrible to contemplate, is remarkably good at scabbing it over with forced forgetfulness, so he put it to a pellet strike on his head. He was vaguely aware that his gun was somewhat heavier, but in his mild bemused state, he did not realize why until sometime after he'd pointed it at a trainee manager, Norman Weathered from International Audit, and pulled the trigger.